verb, and it also combine el combines elements of a substantive, a noun or an adjective. So it starts out looking like starts out looking like a starts out looking like a verb, and it ends up looking like a noun or an adjective. See that there? All right. Translate boy to das contest. The ones who are teaching. All right. The ones who are teaching. This lesson talks about another part of speech completely and entirely, a different one, called the infinitive. If the participle in English adds what suffix? Ing, right? How do I communicate the infinitive in English? I have to add a preposition in front of the verb. What preposition in English do I add? That's it. That's it. Two. Two. So, here is the infinitive of Luo, the present active infinitive. To <coughs> loose. Translate. To teach. Translate. To hear. Got it? That's all it is. Now let me explain something about the infinitive. The word infinitive comes from the Latin infinitivus, and that simply means not limited, not finite, not limited. Okay, now the question is not limited as to what? Not limited as to what? Well, look at the way. It's not limited as to two things. Number one, the person, and the, the secondly, the number. As opposed to Lues. Let's just say Lues. You see Lues and Lues, they're close, right? Watch, watch Lues. Is Lues limited as to person and number? Yes. yes. What person is Lues? Second. What number is Lues? Singular. So it is limited both as to person as, and to number. In other words, this suffix tells me who is doing the Luing. Who is doing the Luing? Translate to A's. You. You are doing the looing. <laughs> the infinitive is not telling us who is doing the looing. It's just saying that the looing is happening. It's not saying who is doing the looing. The looing is happening. See that? It's just too loose, right? This is you loose. This is too loose. Who is doing it? The Greek isn't telling us, right? A verb that, watch this, a verb that limits the person and number is called a finite verb. It's limited. A verb that does not qualify the person and number is called an unlimited or infinitive. Got that? Okay. Not finite. What does finite mean? Limited. What is Infinitive mean, not limited. Not limited as to what two things? As to person and number. So both of these verbs start out the same, don't they? Both are telling us that looming is occurring. This one is telling us who is doing the looming. This one is intentionally refraining from telling us who is doing it. And therefore, it is not limited as to what two things again? As to the person and number. Something else we need to talk about. This is a present infinitive. Now watch this carefully. Outside of the indicative mood, the word present doesn't refer to time. This has nothing to do with time. It has everything to do with verbal aspect. The word present means this kind of aspect. The word eris, the eris infinitive, means this kind of aspect. <coughs> so let me illustrate. Oops, I just erased what I... Here's your present infinitive of blue all. And here's your errors infinitive of blue all. See the sigma infinitive? Both of these are translated to loose. This is to loose. This is to loose. Both are infinitives. What's the difference? The difference is verbal aspect. The present Infinitive implies what kind of aspect? What's, what's the word I use? Imperfect. 
imperfective. What does imperfective mean? Not completed. Okay? Whereas aristic aspect is simple, undefined, a aristos aspect. It is just saying to lose. This is saying to, someone paraphrase for me, to be loosing, to keep on loosing, to can habitually loose, to go on loosing. Can you hear the difference? Let me give you an example. Philippians 1.21. Many of you have memorized Philippians 1.21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is is gain. Remember that? For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. There are two infinitives. Did you hear them? To live and to die. One of those is a present infinitive, and one of those is an heiress infinitive. Can you tell me which one is the present? Can you guess? To live. Paul is not saying, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's saying, for me to, to go on living. Can you hear the difference? Remember, Paul had been tried before the mouth of the lion. The guy's name was Nero. He didn't know what the verdict was. The verdict was either going to be life or death. He didn't know. He didn't know what the verdict was going to be. And so he said, for me to go on living is Christ and to die is gain. Why is it gain? Because I simply get more of Christ. Okay? So, there's a, there's a significant difference in the Greek between the present and the heritage. And by the way, what is the unmarked default to be expected tense? If I just want to say, I want to go, I'm going to use what? The heirs. Heirs, heirs, heirs. But when the author switches to a present, that becomes what? That becomes exegetically significant. And even your literal translations won't bring it out. Even your most literal Bible translation, your New American Standard, your Revised Standard Version, will translate both of these how? To lose. They'll translate both of them to lose. But the present infinitive is very, very significant. Because it's, it's emphasizing what kind of aspect in, effective, ongoing, linear, habitual, continual, iterative. I don't care what you use, as long as you kind of see the line, right? See that line going on there? Okay. If you will, turn the page to the forms of the infinitive, 148, page 148. Let's go over the forms of the infinitive. We have the active, the middle, and the passive. The present active is Luane. The aorist active is Lucy, and the perfect active is Lelukenai. By the way, the two most common uses of the infinitive, or tenses of the infinitive, are the present and the aorist. You will rarely, if ever, see a perfect infinitive. By the way, what are the two most common tenses of the participle? <coughs> present and the aorist. And you will rarely, if ever, see a perfect participle. Now, in the exercises you did for today, there was how many perfect participles? There was what, remember? Remember that Gegramena? That was perfect passive. All the others were either present or heiress. Did you notice that? So expect the present and expect the heiress. And of the two, what would be the unmarked default to the expected one in the infinitive? It's going to be the heiress. Expect the heiress infinitive, the heiress infinitive, the heiress infinitive. Don't expect Vinaske, don't expect Akue, expect Akusa. That's, can you see that's the heiress infinitive? Expect Didaxa. Oh, what process has happened here, by the way? That's called amalgamation. Don't expect Lue, expect Lusa. Let's look at the middle voice. <coughs> Present middle, Lues side. Aerospittle, Lusas thigh. And the perfect middle, Le Lus thigh. The present passive is Lus thigh. The aorist passive is Lu thenai. Do you see the theta eta? That's aorist passive. And the perfect passive is Le Lus thigh. Le Lus thigh. 
On the next page, I have given you the most common second aorist infinitives. For example, just look at the board. Can anybody tell me the source of this infinitive? Labano. Can anybody tell me the source of this infinitive? Man Thano. Yes. Man Thano. Now notice these are what errors? Are these first errors or are these second errors? <laughs> now watch this. The second errors infinitive uses the same suffix as the present. present. Okay? But can you still see that it's an infinitive here? It's still an infinitive. How do you know it's an errors? In internal stem change. So what would be the present infinitive? Long. Bane. You see it there? La bane and la bane. Both are infinitives. One is a present infinitive, the other is what? An aorist infinitive. How can I tell? The verb has undergone a what? An internal stem change. Whereas with the first aorist, I have to add the what? The sigma alpha. The sigma alpha. So what tense, what tense is Lue? Present. What tense is Lucy? What tense is Labe? What tense is Lambane? What tense is Mate? What tense is Dedaske? What tense is Dedoxi? Eris. What tense is Akue? What tense is Akusa? Eris. Expect which one? Eris. Don't expect Akue, expect Akusa. Don't expect Lue, expect Lusa. Don't expect the dots gain, expect the dot side. Okay? That's what you want to expect. Turn the page again, uses of the infinitive. Let me just uh, point out to you on page 150 at the bottom of the page. At the bottom of the page. What is the negative adverb with infinity? Look at the bottom of the page. Can you tell me what it is? That's right. May. In the indicative mood, what's my negative adverb? And what are its allomorphs? I have ooh, ook, and yeah, ooks. Ooks. That kind of looks like ooks, doesn't it? How do I pronounce it? Ook. Ook, right? And then I have may. Why does Greek have a whole different word for not? Because may is used in the non non indicative moods. How many non-indicative moods have we learned? We've learned the participle and now the infinitive. When we learn the subjunctive, it'll be the same thing. It'll be the same thing. Please make a mental note. If you use a negative adverb with the infinitive, you cannot use ooh. You must use may. You must use may. Well, we've covered many of the different uses there, but um, it's not so bad. Um, let me, let me call your attention to an example on the bottom of 147. This is kind of a neat one. If you'll turn back to 147. Bottom of 147, Acts chapter 15. Do you see the example there? It said, Barnabas wanted to take John, but Paul thought it best not to take him. <laughs> this is so neat and Greek. Remember after, the, after uh, the first missionary journey, there was a falling out between Paul and whom? A guy named John Mark, remember? What happened, at the, what happened during the first missionary journey? John Mark what? He left. He left. He deserted. He deserted them. Why? Oh, he's homesick. He missed Mama. <laughs> <laughs> Went back to Jerusalem. <laughs> no, why did he go back? It was a theological problem. Who was Paul's first convert recorded in the first missionary journey? Yeah. No. It was a guy named. It was on which island? Uh, uh, the very first missionary term. It's on the island of Cyprus. He went to the island of Cyprus. And there was a Roman proconsul. It's like the big the big shot, the big big Roman governor of the whole island. His name was Sergius Paulus. He was a Gentile. And he got saved. And Paul did not require him, first of all, to become a what? A Jew. And that raised the theological question in the early church. Can a person get saved without first becoming a 
In other words, can a person be saved apart from the rites, rituals, and institutions of the world's greatest religion? And, and what was the answer? Yeah. Sergius Paulus got saved. And he was not required to be circumcised. He was not required to observe any of the Jewish rites, was he? No. Now that was such a phenomenal thing that John Mark, I believe, had theological objections. He went back. And, and the reason I think that is because at the end of the first missionary journey, what happened to Jerusalem? They had the Jerusalem what? In, in AD 49, recorded in Acts chapter 15, they had what we, we call today the Jewish, the Jerusalem seminar. You know, they had the seminar. You know how popular seminars are today. They had the big seminar in Jerusalem. And that was the question was, do you have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? And how did the church answer that question? No. no. Right? Right? They gave Paul, it said they gave Paul the right hand of Christian fellowship, right? Equality in the body of Christ. Equality in the body of Christ. Now here's what I want you to know. Notice this. This is now the second missionary journey. Barnabas wanted to take John. You see it there? Are you, have I lost you? We're on page 147. <laughs> Barnabas wanted to take. What tense of the infinity is that? But Paul thought it best not to take. Same verb. <laughs> but what? What tense of the infinity? Can you hear the difference there? It's so cool. It's like, hey, I want to take him. And Paul says, I am not going to be taking him ever again, right? I will never be taking him again. I cannot trust him, right? He is blown. And so we have a division, don't we? You know, we have a great disagreement, a great division, and isn't the Lord so gracious? You know, when we have our divisions, the Lord overrules. The Lord always overrules our weaknesses. And instead of having one missionary party, there are how many missionary parties that are going out? There are two, right? Two missionary parties going out to, to evangelize. God is always so gracious. He stoops to our weaknesses and even blesses us when we have our divisions and our problems and our fallouts with one another. Okay? But Paul, you see, Paul says, I'm not going to be taking him. Now, of course, was the problem eventually reconciled? Yeah. We know that from Colossians 4, don't we? Right? Because he, he, Paul refers to Mark as his, as, his, as his very faithful helper. Okay? So we know that the problem was eventually reconciled. But at this point, it wasn't. Now, can you see how, how subtle that is? He wanted to take. He didn't want to take. But in the Greek, you go from the errors infinitive to the one to the present. And that becomes, to me, that becomes the exciting. I like to see stuff like that. I like to see it because none of your English translations will ever bring that out. But the Holy Spirit brought it out. <laughs> yeah, and I'd rather go with the Holy Spirit myself. You know, I like when some of you, some of you want to check your answers, you know, for the exercises, and so you come up to me and says, wait a minute, the English says this, this, I looked at this, this was in the, in, in the inner linear. And, and, and the inner linear is right. I don't care what the Greek says. I don't care what the Greek says. It's like the imperfect that did not scan, right? And, you know, the inner linear says ta. Well, I don't care what the inner linear says. If the Bible says imperfect, he was teaching, then we have to go with the what? Yeah, just have to go with the Bible. You are learning Greek not to follow the English and then occasionally check the Greek. You're learning Greek to, to read the Greek and then occasionally check the English. See? That's why you're learning the Greek. All right. Well, let's go to the vocabulary for this lesson, gentlemen. Now, I know that in the last lesson you had a long list of words, didn't you? In this last lesson on the parts, you had a long list of words. And so I felt maybe it'd be better just to give you a short list this time around. Page 152, here's your vocabulary. The first word is they. You see it there? They. It is necessary. And you see that it takes the, the accusative. It takes the accusative and the infinitive. Here's what I mean by that. It is necessary. Yeah, it is necessary. Let's do it this way. It is necessary to lose. See how it takes the infinitive? And that's why I'm introducing it in this lesson. Day takes the infinitive. Next word also. Existent. It is lawful. So how about ex 
How about existent didoxi? How about translating this for me? It is lawful to teach. Okay? How about this? It is not lawful to teach. How about this? It is lawful not to teach. The last word is mellow, and it also takes the infinitive. Look at this one. Mellow. Translate mellow. I am about to hear. So we have three verbs that take the infinitive. The first one is, <coughs> it is day, right? It is necessary. The second is existi or existent. It is lawful. And the last one is mellow. And this also always takes the infinitive. I am about, and then you just put whatever infinitive you need there. I'm about to do something. Two additional words. We have an adverb prim, which means before, and then we have a conjunction hoste, hoste, which means so that. All right, before we break, let's do a couple. Look at number one, please, in the exercises. Let's see what we can do with this. Number one, let's do some sight reading. By the way, look at the mark of punctuation at the end of the sentence. Do you see it there? Okay, keep that in mind. Dunamai means I am able. So, pistuete, translate. This is a question. Yeah. If it wasn't a question, we would translate it, you believe, right? Now make it a question. Do you believe? Translate the hati. That dunamai, I am able. Now go to poesai. Now that's an infinitive. Just put what English preposition? To, and now do poesai. To what? Do, and then to top. This. So give me the whole sentence. Ready? Begin. Do you believe that I am able? to do this. Parse for me or a side. Now watch this. When you parse an infinitive, you only have to give four things. And here are the four things. Tense, voice, mood, and source. Do you need to give person a number? No. Why? Because this is one part of speech. It's called an Infinitive. What does the word infinitive mean? Not limited. You ask the question, not limited as to what? What two things? Person and number. Good. So, look at point A side, and let's parse it. We need to give four things. We need to give the tense, the voice, the mood, and the source. What tense is it? Can you see the sigma alpha in it? So what tense is it? Good. It's errors. It's active, and now what is going to go in the mood slot? What's our new word now? <laughs> yeah, and here's how you'll just, just abbreviate it like this, if you will. So what are my options? I've got indicative, I've got participle, and now I've got to add one more, right? I've got the infinitive. So akusai is a aorist. I'm sorry, poiesai is an aorist. Active, infinitive from what verb, class? Poi, poi eo. Yeah, I just heard poi eo. Poi, poi, this is poi eo, this is poi eo. Can you hear the difference? Poi eo and poi eo. What letter is this? Eta, what letter is this? Epsilon, can you hear the difference? It's very slight, it's very subtle, but it's important. This is poi eo, this is poi eo. Which one is the source? Poi eo. Good, poi eo. Let's do another one. Go to number four. Take a second to work on number four. The infinitive is la bain. The main is the infinitive. Take a look at number four. See if you can translate number four quietly to yourself. All right, who 
wants to translate it for me. Oxyase lavein tabus leon, raise thine hand if thou wouldst translate it for me. Ledetu. Mm -hmm. No, who else wants to try? Yes. You, you are worthy to receive the book. Perfect. Okay. Tomes can read it again. You are worthy to receive the book. Yeah. You are worthy to receive the book. Look at the verb A. You see the verb A there? Yeah. Translate A, please. You are. Translate oxios. Worthy. Translate labain. To receive. Translate tabibliya. The book. What chapter is this? Revelation chapter 5. And by the way, what kind of a book was it? Was it a codex like this? No, no, no. What kind of a book was it? A scroll. Okay, that's what it means. A scroll. You're worthy to receive the scroll, but we translated the book, right? But just keep in mind, there was no codex form of book in that day. All right? Let's Mars class. Lavain. Are you ready? Think about it first for a second. Now, but think about it before we do it. We've got to get tense, voice, mood, and source. What tense is it? Good. What voice is it? Active. What mood? Now, what word goes in the mood slot? Right, infinitive. And what is our source? La. Ba, no. Is this a first or a second aorist? Second. second aorist. You see how that works? The infinitive is no problem, gentlemen. It is no problem. Let's go ahead and take our break. We'll come back and work on more of these exercises after our break. We are on page 153. Page 153. Let's look at number three and see what we can do with it. We're working on three, five, seven, nine, and eleven. Let's begin with number three. Translate Edokin. Anybody have any difficulty with that? Al toys. To them. Or you could even just say he gave. Then, either way in English would work. Please translate exousion. What did he give them? Authority. Authority. Now, let's go to Genestai. Let's see if we can parse Genestai. Gen S -thai. Let's see if we can parse the infinitive. By the way, notice it's gen and not gin. What is the source of Genestai? Gen my. Notice the internal stem change. So let's parse Genestai. Let's go slowly. We need to give tense, voice, mood, and source. What tense is Genestai? Errors. By the way, what tense of the infinitive did I tell you to expect? Errors. Expect the errors. This is the errors. Can anybody tell me the voice? The opponent. Exactly. It's middle or passive in form, but active in function. What do we call that class of a verb? It's called a deponent verb. So make sure you put D, E, T, okay, in the voice slot. It is aorist, deponent, infinitive. Now you're going to put infinitive in the mood slot, the mood slot. And then what is the source? It is ginomite. So please translate genestai to be come. Or to be, right? Either one. What was given by? I become or I am. So this means to become or to be. All right. So he gave them authority to become not the children of God, but children of God. Good. Any questions on three? Yes, sir. What about right in the place of authority? Uh, right is fine. He gave them, but yeah, the right, I guess you could do the right. Mm -hmm. The right to become or authority to become. Uh, I kind of like, don't like the right because there's no article in Greek, is there? There's no article in Greek. So I think maybe authority might work better here. But either way would be fine. Either way would be fine. Any other questions on three? Well, if not, let's look at number five. Yes, sir? Is it possible to say 
have become. To what? Have. Have become? No. No, no, no. Because that would be what, what tense of the part of the infinitive have? <laughs> Perfect. And what tense is this? It's just generic. Just all, all the errors to say is to become. Yes, that's all it is saying is to become. Not to have, have to become, or to have become. To become. Anything else on three? Let's try five. Translate the second word, please. Or translate the subject, please. Herodes. Did you figure out his name? Herod. By the way, what is it in Amharic? Eros. Herod? Eros. Eros? Eros. Like this? Kind of like? Yeah. Cool. For Herod Mele is about now. Let's go to Zaytain. Here's our infinitive. Zaytain. You ready to parse? Here we go. <coughs> Present, active, infinitive from what verb? Zayteo, right? Is this a contract verb? Yes. Zayteo is the source. Okay? All right, so for Herod was about to cease. Now, literally, the Greek says what? Because it's a, it's a present infinitive. The Greek is really saying what? Herod is about to be seeking. And if you want to translate it that way, that's fine for my purposes. That's, oh, that's a little bit of an over-translation, but I kind of like it better. I would have expected what tense? To Herod. Right? For Herod was about to seek. But, but the author uses a present infinitive, which, in, which says Herod was about to begin the process of seeking. Right? He didn't know how long it would take. He's going to begin the process of seeking. And what is he seeking? Ta idea, the, the child. For what purpose? To apolesi. To destroy out ta. It. It, right? It's neuter. Why is out ta neuter? Because it's antecedent is neuter, right? What gender is top idea? Neuter. neuter. So our ta has to agree with it, right, in gender. And it does. Now, we know that he was looking for a male child, right? So if you translate it to destroy him, that would be okay. But technically, our ta is it. And does it work in English? I think it works in English. Sometimes we refer to a child as an it. Okay. For Herod was about to seek the child to destroy it. Any questions? There is an article where? Two. Yes, two apolesa. Do you see the article in front of the infinitive? Uh, normally we don't translate it. The, the Greek literally says, for Harry was about to seek the child, the to destroy. That's just an idiom of Greek. The article is often used with the infinitive. It's often used, especially with what we call the infinitive of purpose. This is the infinitive of purpose. Why was he seeking the child? You see, the infinitive is indicating what? Purpose. And often with the purpose infinitive, the article is used. Okay? Now, you don't need to translate that article. You don't need to train. In fact, that would be a real over-translation to say the to destroy. Don't do the to destroy. Just do to destroy. Good. Please look at the first word in the sentence, in number five. Please look at the first word. Let's parse some melee. Are you ready? Here we go. Tenses. Present. Voices. Active. Mood is. In. In, in, dicka, tib. You see the, the verb in the, in the vocabulary, mellow? That's just a regular, old-fashioned, omega verb, like luo. Okay, so mele is present, active, indicative. What person in number? Third, singular, and what is the source? Yeah, it's a new verb. Mellow. Mellow is the source. Let me repeat. Present. Active. Indicative. Third. 
singular from mellow. Anything else on number five? Anything at all? All right, let's try number seven. Please translate the second word in number seven. Or, by the way, what kind of a, what kind of a conjunction is gar? We call it a post positive. Why do we call it a post positive? Because it is a word that cannot stand first in its clause or in its sentence. Which position does it normally come? Not the first position, but the second. But could it come the third? Yes. Could it come the fourth? Yes. Could it come the fifth? The normal position is in second position. But there's one position that is excluded. What is it? First. Okay. But you translate it first. So, translate guard number seven, four. Translate your subject, ha io anis. Or, John. Translate hell again. Was saying, translate auto. To him. To him was he, to whom was he speaking? To him was he speaking. To whom was he speaking? To Herod. Yeah, what had Herod done? He had married his brother Philip's wife. Okay? What what was he saying to him? Uk existed. It is not lawful soy. No, 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 not to you. For you. Yeah. To you doesn't work here. It's not lawful to you. It's not lawful for you. Eke, I'll take. Okay, let's look at Eke. We're gonna need to parse Eke. Everybody look at Eke. And let's parse it. We need to give four things. The tense. Voice, the mood, and the source. What tense is that game? Present. Present. What voice is that game? Active. What mood is what word is going to go in the mood slot? Infinitive. Infinitive. Okay. And what is the source? Echo. Okay. So translate that game. To have. And translate outtain. Her. Okay. So let's translate. For John was saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now notice, 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 verbal aspect. We have two occurrences of imperfective aspect. What's the first one? A verb, elegant. What's the second one? What tense was this? Present. What does present mean? It has nothing to do with time of action, but it has everything to do with kind of action. The aorist would mean this, the present means this. So how might we bring this out in our translation? For John kept on saying to him over and over again, this is what got John in trouble. It's not that he just said it once or twice. He kept repeating it over and over again. It is not lawful for you to keep on having her as your wife. You get it? Now, your Bible is going to say what? In fact, does anybody have an English translation they can look this verse up? Does anybody have an English one? What do you got? What version do you have? NIV. Let's look at the NIV on this, if you will. Matthew 14, verse 4. Does anybody have any other translation today? Uh, yes, which one do you have? King James. The which one? King James. The King James. Good. We've got the NIV, the King James. Anything else here? Okay. Would you read the uh, NIV for us, please? Okay, and what does the King James have here? Because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have here. Okay. Kind of, kind of misses it a little bit, right? So what would be another way of rendering it? The elegant. For John kept on saying. And the implication is what? Over and over again, it is not lawful for you to... In other words, he wanted, her, he wanted him to divorce her, right? You, you are in an unlawful marriage. You need to get out of it. Okay, that's what he's saying. You cannot keep on having her as your, as your wife. And the result of saying it over and over again was... That was the result. Got it? That's what got him into trouble. And do you see that in the elegant? Do you see it there? In the elegant? He kept on saying. He kept on saying. He kept on saying. Let's do the parsing. Please look at the first verb in number seven. 
L again. Let's parse the first verb in number seven, L again. What tense is it? If, perfect. What voice is it? Active. What mood is it? Good. Don't forget the good old-fashioned indicative. Can you tell me by looking at the epsilon nu what person and number it is? You can. It's got to be what? Third singular. And what is the source of L again? Lego. Good. Lego. Okay? Now, the next verb form is existent, but you never have to parse it. I will never ask you to parse it because it's what we call an impersonal verb. It only occurs in the third singular. It only occurs in the third singular. It is an impersonal verb. I won't ask you to parse it. However, I will ask you to parse that game. We've already done it once. Can we do it again? Let's parse that game. Ready? Begin. Present. Active. Infinitive from Echo. Good, good. Anything else on seven? Anything at all? Then we will move to number nine. Please translate the second word first. Either therefore or then. Therefore, parakalo, I urge, I exhort, I beseech, King James. Humas, I urge you. Now pick up the ego. I, Hadesmios, the prisoner, not of the Lord, but in the Lord. Got it? I, the prisoner in the Lord. He saw himself in the Lord as a prisoner, in union with the Lord. Axios peripatesi. Let's look at peripatesi. Peripatesi. Can anybody tell me what tense peripatesi is? How do you know? You see the sigma alpha. So let's parse peripatesi. You need to give tense, voice, Mood and source. Tense. Eris. Voice. Active. Mood is infinitive. And what is the source? Tail. Tail? Tail? How about peri Would that work? peri And tepsilon stem contract verb. Peripateo is the source. Peripateo. So, translate peripateo, please. It's an infinitive. To walk. Pick up your axios. To walk how? Worthily. Right? To walk worthily. Taste clay sales of the calling. Okay, let's slow down a little bit. Do you understand? Of the calling there, taste, clay sales. Of the calling, cases with which a clay theta. A clay theta. It's the aorist passive of kalel. You were called. So let's put the whole sentence together. I urge you, I, the prisoner in the Lord, to walk worthily of the calling with which you were called. Let's do some parsing and then we'll open it up for questions. Very first word, par hello. Let's parse it. Are you ready? Here we go. What tense is it? Present. What voice is it? Active. What is the mood? Indicative. Can you tell me the person in them? It's first. Person singular. And what is it from? It's from? Let all. Oh, notice it's an epsilon stem contract verb. An epsilon stem contract verb. Para, notice parakalo is for paraka. No. Right? This is only for parsing purposes. No one would ever say parakaleo. If you contract it, it comes up what? Paraka. No. no one would ever say agapao said. Contracted, aga po se, right? Aga po se, or se aga po, I love you, not aga po. But in terms of parsing, we must always give which form, the contracted or the uncontracted form? Which one? The uncontracted form. See it there? 
What's the next verb we need to parse? Peripatesa. We already did it, but let's do it again. Are we ready? Begin. The tense is Paris. The voice is active. The mood is infinitive. The person is What are you going to do on the quiz? Leave it blank. The number is Leave it blank, right? And the source is very all. By the way, on quizzes or exams, if you were to fill in those blanks, I wouldn't mark it wrong. Okay? If you were to fill it in, I don't mark you wrong for filling in. I just mark you wrong if you, if you incorrectly filled in a slot that was supposed to be filled in. But if you went ahead and did this as a present active or an aorist active infinitive first singular, I, would, I just overlooked the first singular part, okay? All right. But you don't need to put anything in that, those slots, do you? You don't need to put anything in those slots. Um, oh, that clay they tab. Look at the last word. That clay they tab. Let's see if we can parse that one. What tense do you think it is? It is errors. What voice might you think it is? It is passive. And the mood is indicative. The tab will tell you its person and number. Second, plural. And the source is. It's another contract verb. Ka. Ka. Don't say leo, because if you say leo, you're going to put an eta there. This is a ka leo. Ka leo. Greek distinguished between short and long vowels. Greek did. That's why you have two of them. If both were pronounced a, then why would you need two? You know what I'm saying? So try to make a distinction in your pronunciation. This is an epsilon, this is an eta, this is an omicron, this is an omega. All right, now we'll go open for questions on that. Anything at all? Yes, sir. Uh, we supply the electric in the Anything? Yeah. You can do that if it makes better English. It literally says in a lord, doesn't it? Yeah. Or in lord. In lord. In lord. However, sometimes you have to sacrifice accuracy for what? Readability, don't you? Here's a, here's a case of that. We don't say in lord in English. We just don't. We have to say in a lord or in the lord. Remember the, remember the first two words of John 1.1? 1, 1? Translate. In. How, what's the best way of translating those two words? In the beginning. You don't want to say in a beginning, and you can't say in beginning. Okay? You can't do that. So, uh, and by the way, one of the reasons you don't have an article here, here's a rule in Greek. Objects of prepositions in Greek tend to be definite by their very nature. And therefore, Quite often you'll see what omitted. The what article? The definite article. Let me repeat that. Objects of prepositions in Greek, by their very nature, tend to be definite. And for that reason, a Greek author could often leave out the what? Definite article without thinking that anybody would ever translate this out in a beginning. In a beginning. He would, nobody would ever translate this in a beginning, as if to imply there were how many beginnings. More than one, right? In, in a beginning as opposed to this beginning over here. <clears throat> Very good question, Mexican. Any other questions on number nine? All right, we have one more at number 11. Ape and Alcois Jesus, please translate that clause. Jesus said, said to them. Amen, amen. Truly, truly, Lego. Who means? I say it to you. Now, we have Genestai. Have we seen Genestai already today? Yeah. However, this is a unique construction in Greek involving prin. Prin means what? Before. So here's literally what the Greek says. Before Abraham to become. Now, you need to smooth that out in English. You have not had a chance to read the lesson yet. This is explained in the lesson. Print plus the infinitive means before, and then the infinitive needs to be translated into English as a finite verb, not as an infinitive. 
In other words, the Greek says, before Abraham to become. However, that's good Greek, but bad English. So what can I do to smooth that out in English? What do you think? Before Abraham became, or before Abraham was, or before Abraham came into being, okay? Or the way we did it in the ISV, the International Standard Version. Before Abraham existed. Or you could say, before there was an Abraham. <laughs> I kind of like that. Before there was an Abraham, and then go to ego a b. I am. And by the way, in some of your English translations, I am will be in all what? Have you ever noticed that? All what? Caps. Because this is not a quotation, but an allusion to what passage in the Old Testament? Tell me. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Good. All right? This is not a quotation, because, because actually, the full name is I am who I am, right? This is just the I am part. The Greek is egoi mi haon. I am the one who is. So this is an allusion to it. I am. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And I, I wouldn't mind at all if you used all caps like that. Or you can even put it in quotes, right? Because he's really kind of quoting or alluding to Exodus 3.14, the divine name, isn't it? Isn't it the tetragrammaton? Kind of, kind of, sort of is, right? I am. I'm the one who is. I'm the existing one. Um, uh, by the way, let me just review. Uh, in the Septuagint, by the way, did you know that the Greek you're re learning, you can read the Septuagint? Yes. So you can look up Exodus 3.14, and here's what it says. They go, they go at me, ha uh, on. Ha uh, on is, is the participle of a me, the one who is. They go at me, ha on. This is what God said. They go at me, ha on. I am the one who is. By the way, what gender is how old? Yeah, you know, if you were reading Socrates or Plato, God's, God is always ta'an. Can you see the difference? God is ta'an. Neuter. Not the one who is, but that which is. Can, can you hear the difference? God is that which is. But in Judaism and in Christianity, God is personalized, right? God is personalized. And so rather than doing the, using the neuter as in classical Greek, we use the masculine. I am, God is not that which is. God is he who is. The one who is. And so I think John 8, 58 is clearly Jesus is ascribing what to himself? Jesus is ascribing Deity. How do we know? A go a me, right? No. No. There's nothing, there's nothing special or theological about a go a me. Remember this illustration I used before? John 9, remember the man who was born blind? Remember that illustration? And the, the Pharisees were looking for him, right? And they found him after. And they found his parents first, right? They said, why are you asking us? He's of age. Go ask him. And so they find him and say, are you the guy that, that was blind and Jesus healed? And what did he say? That's exactly what he said. He said, hey, go A B. Remember that? So are you going to put that in caps? <laughs> no. Is he claiming to be God? No. All he is saying is, he's, they ask, are you the guy? He said, I am. Yeah, it's me. It's me. So why, if it's the same language, they go A B in John 8, 15, why do we do it this way? Not because of ego in me, because of verse 59. What's the next verse? Says what? They picked up stones to what? Stone him. Why? Because they considered him guilty of blasphemy. Of what? Blasphemy. Right? Claiming to be God. See? There's nothing theological about the going be. It's always the what? What is always the final arbiter of meaning in language? It's always the context. The context. Let's do the parsing, shall we? Look at the first word in number 11, if you will. A pen. Who can parse that for me? Raise thine hand. First word, a pen. Who wants a jam? Parse a pen for me, please. 
Aris. Aris. Active. Active. Indicative. Indicative. Third. Third. Singular. Singular. From Lego. Yes. The source is Lego. Good. Lego is the source of Asia. Aris active indicative. Third singer from Lego. All right, what's our next word? Lego. Shall we parse Lego? Nah, we don't need to parse Lego. Have we done genestai already? We did genestai, but let's do it again. Genestai. What tense is genestai? What tense is genestai? Aris. What voice is genestai? What mood is genestai? Infinitive. And what is the source of genestai? Genomai. Okay? Now look at the last word, they go Amy. Please find Amy. Now let's parse Amy. Are you ready? Present. Now, you can put active, but remember, technically, Amy doesn't have a voice, but if you put active, I won't mark you wrong. But it's technically present, blank, indicative. What person and number? First singular. What is the source of Amy? Amy. Yeah, the source of Amy is Amy. Let's look at the uh, exercises to this lesson. It says this. Read the lesson carefully. Thoroughly review the forms of the infinitive. Note that all forms of the infinitive end in either I or A. That will be a clue that you have the infinitive. Mesmerize the vocabulary to this lesson and be able to translate and parse. And by the way, before you come to class, make sure you consult a literal English translation. But let me tell you this, even though you may consult a literal, they still might not be what the Greek is doing. So make sure you follow the Greek, okay? For example, odd number um, seven. Just do what the Greek says, right? John was saying, or John kept on saying. Follow me? Just, just do what the Greek has. And by, by the way, don't, don't, here, you know, here's what you're going to do today. You're going to, you're going to, see these exercises? You're going to look them up in the English, right? You're going to look them up in the English. And then you're going to look at the Greek. No, 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 no. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to do them in, in Greek. And then, and only then, are you going to consult the English. If you don't do it that way, you'll miss what's in the Greek. You'll be blinded. You know one of the greatest problems is translating the New Testament? We are so familiar with it, aren't we? We're so familiar with it from the English or the Amharic that we even overlook what the Greek has. So start with the Greek, please. Just start with the Greek. But please, before you come to class, consult at least one literal English translation. I was talking to someone uh, this morning that said they have been looking at what's called the Eight Translation New Testament. That's a good book. That's a good source. Eight English translations in one little book. And that might be a good resource to use as well. But there are many, many resources. I wish you all had access to the internet because all you have to do is you click on the internet and it, all the translations you want come right up like that on any, on any verse immediately. But since you don't, go to the library. I was in the library yesterday and I looked. You have dozens of English translations. And I would pick one out that's very literal. And I would certainly try to consult it before you come to class tomorrow. Okay? That's your assignments. By the way, if you notice, we have finished lesson 21. Okay? We finished lesson 21. Our next exam will cover lessons 17 through 21. So tomorrow we have a quiz over 21. Then we review. 17 through 21, and on Friday, what do we do on Friday? We have a review exam over 17 through 21, okay? All right, we're almost there, almost to the end of the semester, so hang in there with me. Thank you for your diligence, your persistence, your perseverance, your patience, your graciousness, your humility, your love, your kindness. I appreciate that very, very much. Let's have a word for everyone. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would dismiss us with the blessing, Lord, of the conscious awareness, <coughs> conscious awareness of your presence in our lives. 
Lord, what a privilege it is to walk with you, to talk with you, to be with you in your presence day by day. Thank you, Lord, for these students. Continue, Lord, to do a good work in their life. Continue to strengthen them, supply their every need. I pray for your physical healing for some of them today that are not feeling well. I pray for your, um, your Holy Spirit to equip and empower them to do above and beyond what they could ever imagine. Or think. Thank you again for your help in this class today.